Joining us now is Elizabeth Dubois, an associate professor with the University of Ottawa. And full disclosure, when going to bars used to be a thing we could do. Uh, both of us have known to visit the same local brewery. Uh, Elizabeth, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay, so between what's going on with the Broadcasting Act to this conversation around where the Liberals are headed with free speech and online harms, and then potentially the prospect of an online focused election campaign. We wanted to dig into this a bit more and we have a lot of ground to cover. So we're just gonna get right into it. Um, so Elizabeth, first for you, we've been watching this conversation around the Broadcasting Act changes, this drama unfold around what's called Bill C-10, uh, around wanting to level the playing field, it seems between um, you know streaming platforms, online social media services and traditional broadcasters. There's been a lot of terms thrown around discoverability programs. Can you kind of just outline for us what exactly are the Liberals aiming to do here? That's a great question. You know, when Bill C-10 started, the initial kind of idea was like, okay, let's fix the Broadcasting Act, which is outdated, right? Like our broadcasting rules aren't really addressing the very complex ecosystem we have at this point when the internet is so embedded in our everyday lives. And so the idea originally was like, let's deal with Netflix and Crave and other, you know, online tools that basically are acting the same way that broadcasters typically did. You know, if it looks like television, treat it like television. And so they were talking about programming, which we could recognize from Netflix programs as well as regular television, but it's expanded and the new turn has been towards let's use this as a tool to regulate platforms more broadly. And so now we're starting to bring in YouTube and other tools talking about discoverability instead of what we used to call CanCon when we were, you know, short forming it. And it was trying to make sure that people could find Canadian content and that there was incentives for people to invest in Canadian content. And so the way Nick Elizabeth has explained it there, I would say is arguably a lot clearer than the minister responsible for it has been lately. Uh, of course, we had uh, Heritage Minister Stephen Gibo on CTV's question period in an interview with our colleague Evan Solomon uh, say initially that people with large followings who are making a lot of money online, so basically influencers, uh, were going to become subject to regulations. He had to quickly walk that back and has kind of been in a political furor over this. Nick, from your perspective, politically speaking, has, has he muddied the waters too much for this bill to still have a lifespan or is it salvageable? Well, you know, I think what's, what's fairly clear is that uh, there's been, and, and I say this without judgment, scope creep on, uh, on when it comes to, to changing the broadcast. Now, to, to Elizabeth's point, everybody knows that the Broadcast Act needs to change. Like it was basically hatched in the 1970s, right? So that needs to change. And, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, the, the gateway issue on, on this was uh, actually under Stephen Harper, this whole idea on taxing Netflix. And then they, talk, then, it, then they talked about Canadian content and then talked about competitiveness. And now we're into a place where I don't think anyone really anticipated where, uh, where it's kind of uh, a heavier hand, uh, so to speak, uh, of regulation. And, you know, I think the other thing that we have to put on the table is that we do know uh, that there are political implications here too, because uh, we know that at the same time that social media has been an enabler of politics and political dialogue, there have been some very unsavory parts that many people are uncomfortable about that are happening on social media. So social media, you know, when we think about it, you know, we had the Arab Spring, it would never have happened without the internet and social media, but then at the same time, we're dealing in situations where people are not only spreading hate, and lies. There are foreign actors that are looking to influence politics in Canada and around the world. And I think that I think the liberals are trying to do that. But that's even a bigger, that's even like a bigger issue to try to handle. But I think uh, I agree with Elizabeth 100%. I think they're at like the, the, the intent and the acknowledgement that it needs to be updated is correct. I'm not sure whether the prescription uh, that the liberals are putting out is, uh, is the right prescription. Right. And so there, Nick, you're touching on this broader conversation around where they're headed and uh, whether there should be, I guess, some sort of public discourse about what we expect from our social media platforms and what we want to see. But before we dig into that a bit more, I just on this question, uh, the conservatives anyways are really framing this as a free speech issue that 
Uh, the liberals with the backing of the opposition parties are coming after your free speech. They're going to silence you online. Um, Elizabeth, from your perspective, is it is it that straightforward? Is it that simple of, uh, of a reality with C10? It really isn't that simple. You know, I am I am all for the free speech conversation. I think it is essential, but we're not talking about unfettered access to sharing your opinions and your ideas. It is not free speech the way we might think about chatting with our friends as we're walking through a park or, or in our own homes. All of these platforms, their business model at its very core is control of our information. They control information in order to serve it up to us better, more effectively, more efficiently. We rely on them. It's a really helpful service. But for us to think that the options are either our government to decide what gets shown on our threads and feeds or we decide like that's just not how it is these companies have a massive amount of power and so the recognition that maybe that power should be regulated to some extent i think is an important one and i frankly worry that the c10 discussions are undermining our ability to come up with good collections of legislation that are going to help us maintain a healthy internet that we can engage in Right. And so, Nick, this is obviously resonating with people. It's an emotional statement to make that they're going to be censoring you online. And I'm, I'm in the same way wondering how this is going to impact the other conversation. So C10 is one aspect. This is focusing on CanCon, essentially. Uh, there are some questions around even those regulations still changing what you see online. Um, but going forward, the government has promised to bring forward what they're framing as an online harms approach. So they want to tamp down on hate speech, pornography online. Um, I'm wondering if from the public opinion perspective, you know, Bill C-10 isn't necessarily something everyone's tuned into, but the concept of what you can see and use online, it's our lives. It, it, do you think that it's reaching the point where um, Canadians are tuning out from this conversation and it's going to make it hard for them to approach this in any other regulatory way going forward? Well, you know, I don't think, I don't think Canadians are being served by uh, either, you know, I think what they'd like to see is a middle path between you know, the free speech on the one side, and then we need to completely intervene, uh, that they would like to see something that's more pragmatic. And, and I, the other thing is, is I believe that there's a lot of room for the platforms to engage on this, that uh, it's not just something, it's not just a solution that's going to kind of pop out of the government. And uh, thank you very much. You know, the, the interesting thing is in, in some research that we did for the University of Ottawa uh, earlier this year, uh, we did some work on on different on trust of different sources of information, and uh, this had to do with uh, climate change. And it was interesting that only about one out of 20 Canadians actually trust social media for information related to climate change. And there's two ways to look at it. The way I would look at the at the information is Facebook, Twitter, all you social media platforms, you have a stake and building credibility on your platform as a source for discussion and knowledge and knowledge dissemination. And, uh, you know, and, and that I think Canadians would welcome solutions that came forward uh, from, uh, from the different platforms. And in the same way that, uh, although, you know, and, and in the same way that when we're looking at the government, they would be kind of, they would want to see government working collaboratively with stakeholders and trying to balance interests in order to uh, serve Canadians. So, you know, the, I, th I think what we do know from a research perspective is that, is that there's a problem. The government knows, and you know, average Canadian knows that there's a problem on a lot of social media platforms. But what, what to me that means is that we need to find solutions. And it's not just government regulation can be part of that because that's part of a lot of public policy solutions, but it shouldn't be the end all and be all. And it should include uh, it should include the platforms advancing uh, advancing solutions that can that can better serve the people using the, their platforms. Elizabeth, it looks like you want to hop in there. What do you make of what uh, Nick's saying? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I absolutely agree that you know the government just coming in and saying this is how it's going to go isn't going to function. They don't know the ins and outs of of how the platforms work. And those platforms exist in an international context, right? They don't, they don't have Canada first as their goal. Our government should. So on one side of this, there might be an argument for when B, in the Bill C-10 case, like there's maybe been a little bit too much input from platforms and not enough input from the actual Canadian creators whose content we're trying to, to ensure gets out there. Uh, on the other hand, 
we do also have this complete lack of transparency so often when these platforms are deciding how content shows up or doesn't show up. And so I'd say for that sort of collaborative approach that you're talking about, Nick, what we need first is a, a commitment to transparency and to yeah. explaining how are you making these choices, you massive, massive, powerful platforms. Yeah, and you know, Elizabeth, to your point, I agree with you 100%. Um, some platforms have been more transparent than others in terms of how their algorithms have worked. And, uh, and I don't think there's any downside to transparency uh, because uh, I think people, uh, people have the right to know uh, how their relationship is, uh, is, I'll call it optimized uh, on the platform. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that's probably a really good first step. Let's just put a spotlight uh, on it. And you know, I don't see what I don't see what the downside is for platforms to compete on being responsive and having better algorithms and being transparent. Like that's the type of competition that we need uh, in order to uh, have a better experience for everyone. And so, Elizabeth, you touched on there kind of a, a really good point that these aren't just Canadian companies; they're operating around the world. I'm wondering where uh, Canada stands when it comes to regulating web giants in contrast with some other countries. Yeah. So around the world, there are governments just struggling to try and figure this out. Nobody has, you know, the perfect solution. There isn't a country we can point to and say they figured it all out. <laughs> we do know that, you know, across Europe, there's been a lot of advances, particularly on the online, online harms front. There's been some examples that we can learn from. Uh, and then there are other kind of more niche areas where Canada has been more of a leader. So our election advertisement registry was actually one of the first worldwide and has led to progress in other places. But we don't have one particular country we can go and say, they've figured it out, let's, let's copy them. Right. And so you mentioned there um, elections, and that's, of course, all of these are things are connected and <laughs> one regulations and policies hit on the next. And so Nick, you've also touched on this earlier on about the uh, the political implications here and, you know, when platforms are used by social or by political parties, for example, uh, we're heading into an election period. I think all the speculation is that sometime in the fall, there's going to be a vote. Um, and while, yes, things are kind of opening up, I don't necessarily know that we're going to be seeing the traditional door knocking that we usually do. The campaign is largely going to be fought online and through social media. So, Nick, I'm wondering your thoughts on um, how things are shaping up from a pandemic election perspective and tying it to this conversation around the role of social media. We've had you know, in instances in the past of foreign interference in elections. Where are you at right now, just in terms of your um, thoughts on questions that are gonna come up or um, preoccupations you have about where things stand? Well, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is, you know, there's been a lot of research done by uh, the folks at the Oxford Internet Institute where now they're now, because of the spotlight, people are monitoring and organizations, universities are now monitoring the internet all the time during elections and trying to get an understanding. And I think the, I think the reality is, is that there will be fake news and there will be foreign interventions. And the question is how much fake news and how much interventions. And I would say that that's, that's part of the calculus that the liberals have. Uh, in this, that they're worried about either foreign actors trying to influence or, or fake news. And, you know, the, to put a little bit of a context on this, you know, in the, in the last election, there was fake news that was coming out of something that was, if you remember, Rachel, that Buffalo news story, uh, you know, Buffalo news that looked like real news, but wasn't really news. And, uh, and, and I think what the government is trying to do is to clamp down on that. You know, the last thing that we need in an election you know, we is to focus on the process as opposed to focusing on Canadians making choices about the future of the country. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, one of the risks that we have in this election is, uh, is a distraction in terms of fake news, some type of kind of dissemination of, of falsities that, uh, that is a distraction from the core, the core reason to have an election, which is who do you want to govern the country and who has the best plan and uh, how do you want to move forward? So, uh, so I think I'll make a prediction in the next election that something will happen on the internet related to kind of foreign intervention or fake news. And uh, it, will be a, it will be a significant distraction for the campaign. Maybe we won't be talking about issues like healthcare 
the pandemic jobs as much as we should because of uh, some of these dis potential distractions. Well, and that's just a, such a great point, Nick, in the sense of uh, ahead of the 2019 election, we had a very concerted conversation around interference and the laws and the way things are going to be working, but we have not really had a conversation or seen any substantive legislative changes um, between then and now. And so we're headed into pro probably an election where uh, there likely won't be much legislative change and not a lot of focus or conversation around the risks of foreign interference. And of course, as we've talked about in the other topics, uh, these platforms evolve constantly. They're always being found new ways to manipulate. And, and so it is possible, I guess, that there will be new holes that we didn't consider. Um, Elizabeth, from your perspective, I know you're kind of watching this space closely. Are our laws set up to handle that right now? You know, it's a good question because we just don't know what the next sort of set of innovative practices are going to be, you know, and those innovative practices might be really beneficial. They might be ways of getting people engaged that we couldn't have imagined before we were forced to run an election primarily online, but there could be really negative ones. And, you know, Nick, you mentioned the potential for foreign interference, for mis and disinformation. Um, one thing that we know since the last election is that uh, Election Modernization Act had a bit about sharing in inaccurate information, sharing disinformation. Uh, and currently, that's not really in play because a challenge has gone through the court system. And so, you know, the liberals are trying to get the word knowingly in there. So at the very least, we can deal with people who very intentionally are spreading disinfo. It's not clear whether or not that'll be able to happen before the writ drops. I'd also say there were some things that that Modernization Act tried to do, but didn't fully accomplish. You know, I mentioned the ad registry earlier. Well, one of the things that's missed is what about people who are sharing political information? They're being paid to share that information, so advertising, but it's not through an actual advertising system. You know, if you pay an influencer to talk about how great your party is on YouTube, that's not showing up in an ad registry. That's probably not showing up in a budget line for a campaign, but it is paid dissemination of a political message. Are you, Elizabeth, are you trying to cheer us up? I'm not sure you're doing a very good job because you know- Well, you put, it's sunny, you how's that? That's, but, that's a happy No, but you, but you, you, you basically put a spotlight on the fundamental problem, right? That you know, if you think that we can monitor everybody, every place and everything that they say, and to have, it's just, at least today, that's not possible. And I'm not even saying that that's even desirable, but it's just not possible. And, uh, you know, so it just, so, you know, the big question is how resilient are we as a democracy and how, how, how resilient do we need to be so that we can have stable elections uh, that, that deliver outcomes that Canadians are happy with? Yeah, I think you touched on a great point, kind of a place to end it there, Nick, in the sense of um, everybody is online, everybody is posting things and using social media. And you're right that it is uh, nearly impossible to have eyes on all of it. And especially in um, certain ways, you have no idea what's being said in certain channels. So it's definitely a big challenge. And I think we've had a, a good conversation here about some of the holes in the way the government's approached it. And surely this is not gonna be a conversation that ends here. Uh, just before we go, Elizabeth, is there any kind of main takeaway you have or something that you're watching uh, that you think our audience should keep an eye out for? You know, I think one of the major things we need to do is focus on the fact that no one bill is going to regulate the web giants. And so, yes, look at what Bill C-10 evolves or dies. Um, and, and then also look at the online harms, look at privacy, look at competition policy. This is a wicked problem and requires a bunch of different perspectives and different departments and different pieces of legislation. Right. And Nick, what's your uh, takeaway from today's chat? My takeaway is a variation of what Elizabeth said, that the government should not overreach. It obviously needs to do stuff, but it should be looking at what is practical what is realistic and what can have a meaningful positive impact. And uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that incremental approach uh, as opposed to being overly ambitious on this. Right, and I guess communication, communication, making sure that people are understanding this and can come alongside and understand what's actually going on and not be um, confused or frustrated for reasons they might not necessarily need to be. 
Um, okay, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. If our listeners or viewers want to follow you or listen to your podcast, where can they do that? Yes, so I host a podcast called Wonks in War Rooms where Paul Com Theory meets on the ground strategy. So you can find us on Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm also at Liz Dubois on Twitter and you can find me and my students work at the paulcomtechlab.ca. Awesome. And Nick, uh, where can people find all your latest work? So oodles of stats at www.nanos.co. You would be surprised how much data is there and it's all free. Anyways, uh, that or Twitter at Nick, N-I-K, Nanos. Uh, Nick, I would not be surprised at how much data is there. Pretty much every question I put to you, you've got a Too stat much. and we appreciate you for that. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Rach A. Ello. Thanks so much for you both. Uh, this is actually my last podcast filling in as guest host. Michael Stiddle will be back in time for next episode. Uh, Nick, thanks so much for a great couple months. Really fascinating conversation. I will keep listening. And you can find Trendline on ctvnews.ca, ctvnews' YouTube channel, and everywhere you get your podcasts. Thank you guys so much.